gonna be a minute. I forgot to get it here. All right, Ezekiel chapter 33. Father, we thank you for your word, every bit of it. This prophetic portion is so powerful. Speak to our hearts, transform and renew our minds. And as you have said over and over through the book of Ezekiel to your people, and we're your people, that we would know that you are the Lord, that you are God, that we would know that and really know it. Not academically, but deep within our hearts, you are God. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So starting at verse 33 through the remainder of the book, it's, it's the final section of the book. And we had those few chapters where he started, you know, prophesying to the surrounding nations. Now he's back again, focusing on the nation of Israel. And a lot of this section has uh, a good amount of end times prophecy. There's a little bit in, t in tonight's section, but um, that's where we're at now. And so verse 1 of chapter 33. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So this is the second time in the book of Ezekiel where he, God speaks to Ezekiel using the image of a watchman. The first time was way back in chapter three. And, and he starts in this section by kind of just explaining the, the, the purpose and job of the watchman. In those times, the city's main type of protection was there, they were walled cities and, and those walls had towers and the towers had guys up on them and they would watch. They were watchmen and they would watch for enemy attacks. They would watch for dangers that was coming upon the city. And if danger was coming, their job was to let everybody know. Typically they would blow a trumpet or, or you know, and their different trumpet blows would mean different types of things regarding danger that was coming, whether it be an invasion or something like that. And, and, and then the people would hear that warning and they would know one way or the other, they would know what they're supposed to do. Not everybody who lived in the city lived in, inside the wall. Sometimes people lived outside on the outskirts of the walls. And if they heard the warning, then they would know, if I want to be safe, I should go and get inside uh, behind the walls and, or whatever other appropriate action would keep them safe. But, but the watchman, that was his job. His job was just to warn. And that was mainly it, to watch and warn. And, and so with that job, God tells, you know, he d explains that whole thing. They, all under, they would all understand it. And, and if the watchman does his job and warns the people, then he's fully done his job. If the people hear his warning and won't listen, and then they die, the watchman is not responsible for that. And, and it, there, it's their own fault. He did everything he was required to do. But if the watchman watches and he doesn't warn, or if he doesn't watch, or if he watches and doesn't blow the trumpet and doesn't warn, if the people die, it will be because he failed them and then he is accountable for that. So that's all he's been saying here in these first six verses. 
verse 7. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from me. Oh, I just lost my place. Therefore, you shall have a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So the first six verses, he just, you know, he re refreshes us on what a watchman's all about. And now with that idea well established, God again applies it to this, specifically the ministry of Ezekiel, even though in general it, it applies beyond that. He says, Ezekiel, I've made you a watchman for Israel, metaphorically, of course. And he says, it's your job to warn the people about wickedness, because wickedness is dangerous. Just like an enemy out there is dangerous, wickedness is dangerous. It's your job to warn them about enemy attacks, enemy attacks, spiritual types of enemy attacks. And so God is telling Ezekiel, I'm giving you a message of warning about the wickedness and the sin of my people, and you're supposed to tell them. And if you do, and they don't repent, it's on them. You, you've done everything you're supposed to do. Their judgment is on them. But if you don't and they die because of their sin, they're still guilty for their sin. It's, it's not that they're not guilty for their sin. But in addition to that, the watchman, you, Ezekiel, you'll be guilty too. And so he was just, he was just being reminded that his job as a prophet, and God calls him a watchman, was to speak the message that God gave him. Just speak it faithfully, precisely. Give warning just like God gave it to them. And, and, and so this, this message here that he's telling Ezekiel, this is extremely important to anyone who handles the word of God. Anyone who has, is, has given any kind of ministry of being a message of God's truth. We, we are supposed to see what it says, compare it to what's going on, whether it be the world or people's lives, and our job is just to simply deliver it. And, and if it's warning that's in the passage because this is what the passage says and here's what's going on, then we're supposed to say it. If it's some sort of sin because here's what the passage says about sin and here's what the culture's doing with sin or here's what the Bible says about sin and here's what certain people are doing with sin, then we're just supposed to give it. That's the warning. If we, if we in any way change it because we're afraid that somebody might not like it or something like that, then we're like the watchman who doesn't give the warning. And then any kind of, their sin's still on them, but any kind of worse that happens to them because they uh, didn't, weren't given the full extent of how bad things could be, that becomes the responsibility of, of the messenger. To, so if God's word says, this is what God's word says, and you're living like that, and I don't say it, I'm going to be in trouble. If they keep living in it, I'm going to be in trouble. If, and, and if, or if, but if I don't tell it, or if I do tell it and they keep living it, then I'm off the hook. And so we're not responsible for any more than that. And we'd better not do any more than that. And we better not do any less than that. That's it. Just what does it say? And, and if we do that simple thing to give God's word as it is and include any, any wrong, any warning, the messenger has faithfully done their job. I don't know any Bible teacher that doesn't want to see results, that doesn't want to see people respond. I don't know any Bible teacher, like a real Bible teacher, that doesn't want to see people from the teaching of the Word of God come to faith. I don't know anyone that doesn't want that. Every Bible teacher I know wants people to come to faith when they teach the Bible. I don't know any Bible teacher that doesn't want to, from as they teach the Word, to see that people who are in sin repent of their sins because they heard the Word of God. 
every Bible teacher I know would want that. That, you know, they were teaching and somebody was in sin and they heard the word of God and they repented and they got back on track or they, you know, whatever. Every Bible teacher I know wants that. I don't know any Bible teacher that doesn't want when they're teaching that people are so blessed by it that they tell other people and they want those people to come listen to it too. Every Bible teacher I know wants that. But that is not what God requires of the Bible teacher. That's not what he requires at all. The only thing that God is requiring is that the messenger tells the message faithfully. That's, his, that's it. All that other stuff, we kind of put that on ourselves. Of course, we want to give every opportunity for people to repent and come to faith and respond, but, but it doesn't matter ultimately if nobody responds as long as the person who's given the message does it faithfully and completely and diligently. And, but if he tries to hold back or says what's liked or what's easy, then that messenger is as, in much as trouble as the one that's sinning. And so we have to see that, that, the ministry that way. Verse 10. Therefore, you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? So the next thing Ezekiel is to say is this. He's, he's supposed to go tell the people, you people go around and here's what you're always saying. And, and he basically, God says to go tell them that they're always accusing of God of being too harsh. You, you go around saying that God's already made up his mind that, you know, who, uh, who's a sinner and who's not and, and that they're going to be judged no matter what. And the idea was that they were complaining that God's so harsh that it doesn't matter what we do. He's just going to judge whoever he wants to judge. And he's going to judge us anywhere. And so it doesn't, he does, it doesn't matter one way or the other. God's just too harsh. That's what they were complaining. They were accusing God of being harsh and unfair, and which is insane because they're saying this at a time when God's been warning them about judgment for over 40 years. And so God's always patient with sinners. He's always way, gives way more time for people to repent. And so here's what God says to that lame accusation in verse 11. He says, you couldn't be more wrong. I'm not harsh. He says, I don't want people to die. I don't even want the wicked to die. He said, I don't even, I don't have any pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's not what I want. That's not what I'm looking forward to. That's not my desire. I want people to be saved, God says. I, I even want the wicked to be saved. I want them to repent and live. And, and it's an amazing thing about the grace of God that, that that's what he wants. He wants sinful people to turn from their ways. How different is God than we are? When, when, you ha when you have somebody who does something offensive to you, I don't know if you're like me, but my natural reaction is typically I want to punch them, right? I mean, somebody does something offensive to me personally. My, usually, my initial reaction is not, oh man, I just want those, that person to just have a change of heart and know the peace of God. That's what I should want. But usually, because I'm a sinner, my first reaction is of being offended is, can I get away with punching this guy? You know, that's the kind of thing. And God's like, you think I'm harsh? Man, you have me all wrong. The, wick, the most wicked among you I want to save. And, and that's, that's what is the Ezekiel's entire ministry, as well as Jeremiah's, was to seek to get these people who are ripe for judgment to understand that is the last thing that God wants to do. You're about to be judged even though God doesn't want to at all. Do you know how much sin it takes to get this God to get to the point where he's actually going to judge you because he doesn't want to? And so his whole ministry is that, man, just repent. You don't, don't you know how easy it is to just get this whole thing to turn around? Just get it completely turned around. Just repent. That's all you got to do. And, and that's God's idea for anyone who preaches the word to get people to just repent. To at least tell them that's all that God needs. Is that you just repent and, and he will 
turn the whole thing around. Verse 12, Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, The righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, but, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered. But because of the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge or gives back what he has stolen and walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. So here's another issue that God addresses. Uh, this I another idea that the people had that were, they were falsely buying into. And the idea was this. They had this idea that it didn't really matter if you changed your life or not. That a bad or wicked person is going to be doomed no matter what. That's what they thought. That's what they wrongly thought. That, you know, if, you, if you've been bad, you're just, it's just over, it's done, nothing. And then the other idea, the, the, the flip side of that that was equally wrong was that the person who did something righteous in their past is set. It doesn't matter if they go and do some evil now because, you know, they did some good things in their past. This is the kind of wrong thinking they had. If you did something good in your past, you're good forever. If you did something bad in your past, you're bad forever. Nothing can change. And God says to this, you couldn't be more wrong about that. A person who has lived in a wicked and sinful way, but repents, they turn away from their sin. God will absolutely show mercy to that person. It doesn't matter how sinful you've been. It doesn't matter how many wicked, bad, terrible things you've done. Stolen from people, lied to people, hurt people. If you turn from that, God will, will show mercy and grace to the person who does that. And the person who lived right in the past, but then they, and they did right for some period of time. And then they turn to live in sin. They, they're going to answer for that too. That person can't just look to their past deeds and say, no, no, it's all good. It's okay that I sin like this because, you know, I grew up in church, so it's okay. No, no, it's okay that I sin like this because I went forward to Billy Graham. So, you know, Billy Graham. Or no, no, it's okay because I used to go to church and I have an uncle who's a pastor. You, you, you name all these other things. And, and God takes into account, this is what God takes into account. God takes a change of direction into account. He, cha he takes a changed life, good or bad, into account. Any sinner can turn around and start following the Lord. Any sinner can say, I'm done with my sin. I'm going to trust Jesus now. I'm going to ask him for help every day. Anyone can repent and get right. And a person can have been living right for a really long time and then start sinning. And that person, God would say, should in no way feel like they're safe just because of what, what came before. No, it's okay. He says, he says they should never feel safe in turning to sin just because of whatever they have in their past. And so God says, don't think that you're just stuck where you are. If you're in sin, you can repent and get, get in, in the right. If you're doing well and you go bad, don't be comfortable there. It's not okay. And, and so we can turn to righteous living right now. Right now. And we more than Ezekiel's time because we know that Jesus died for our sins. And you can call out to Jesus. You can say, Jesus, save me. Save me from my sins. Help me. I can't do it myself. And he will. Verse 17. Yet the children of your people say, the way of the Lord is not fair. 
but it is their way which is not fair. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. And so they're, they're, they're still complaining that God's not fair. Here's God, here's God warning their nation of judgment. And they're saying no fair. He's been warning them. I mean, how fair is it? He's been warning them for years. God says, you guys are the ones that aren't fair. God takes everything into account. He, he takes repentance into account. He goes, I see right now you, you've changed your heart. You've turned around. And he takes that into account. He also takes into account, oh, you, you think that just because you're some sort of church person and, and you're sinning that that's okay? He, the, here's how, here's the difference. They're saying he's not fair. And he's all, you know what? Who's not fair? You're not fair. You ignore certain things. You think that because you did this in the past and you're sinning now that you're okay. You're totally ignoring that. Or that because you were sinful in the past and you're repenting now that you're, it doesn't make any difference. You're still, you're still in trouble. You're ignoring that. He goes, I don't ignore anything. If a person turns directions, I pay attention to that. <clears throat> and so imagine if society was like that where we didn't take you know, changes into account. Somebody gets arrested for stealing your stuff, right? Let's say somebody, the guy, let's say the guy gets caught for stealing your stuff and, and, the, and, they, and they bring him and he goes, no, no, it's okay because I, I, I you know, let's say this guy, what it is, was like a week ago that this happened and, and they catch him and he goes, no, no, it's okay. I'm not in trouble because I went to church when I was a kid. You'd be like, that literally makes no sense whatsoever. That's not fair at all. But if the person says, I'm sorry, here's your stuff, they're going to be more lenient on that crime. And that's how it works. He says, and that's how God does it. God's ways are right and ours aren't. Verse 21. And it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity in the 10th month, on the fifth day of the month, that one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been captured. Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me the evening before the man came who had escaped, and he had opened my mouth. So when he came to me in the morning, my mouth was opened and I was no longer mute. So somehow, we don't know why, but God had Ezekiel stop speaking. I guess he's like, all right, you've said everything you're going to say. And this guy shows up from Jerusalem. And, and it says, and we have a time stamp here. And that, what this tells us is this is seven years after he'd started his ministry. So Ezekiel, Jeremiah's been prophesying 40 years. Ezekiel's prophesying seven years. And finally, Jerusalem has been conquered. It's been captured. God's word was fulfilled. And God's word is always fulfilled. Every bit of it will be fulfilled, good and bad. Every warning, every promise, every blessing, it's all going to come to pass. Verse 30, verse 23 then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, they who inhabit those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one, and he inherited the land, but we are many, and the land has been given to us as a possession. Now, we've mentioned many times before that Ezekiel wasn't the only prophet. There was a bunch of false prophets that kept going along, going, oh, it's all going to be good. God's on our side. He, he, he's not going to let anything bad happen to us. And he's the one that's saying, God's the one that's saying that he's going to bring judgment. These false prophets are like, no, God... God really likes us. He doesn't care what we do. We're, we're all going to be good. And, and now that they've been conquered, apparently some of these people bought into that so much that even though they've been conquered, they're still saying something similar to that. They're like, no, no, I know, you know, we're surrounded and the Babylonians are here and people got taken away and all that, but it's all good. Think about it. This is their reasoning. Abraham was just one guy and God came and promised him this whole entire land to one guy. We're a whole bunch of people. I mean, if he did it for that one guy, I mean, how much more favor do we have? We're a whole bunch of people. So that was their argument. And so sometimes people can be so blinded by their sin that they can't see judgment even when it's happening to them. They're saying this while they're being judged. Verse 25, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord God, You eat meat with blood. You lift up your eyes toward your idols and shed blood. Should you then possess the land? You rely on your sword. You commit abominations and you defile one another's wives. 
should you then possess the land? So their, their claim that somehow their presence, you know, in light of Abraham being one guy and there are a whole bunch of people, that, that somehow that would incline God to bless them in the land even more than Abraham. God says this about that. He says, you, man, you people are wicked. You're nothing like Abraham. How are you going to... How are you going to appeal to Abraham? You're nothing like Abraham. And he points out how they're not keeping the dietary laws. They worshiped idols. They were violent. And then and and two times he says, and you think you should be keeping the land when you're living like that? And, and there are those who, there, it, it, sometimes people can be so caught up in sin and then point to some religious activity that they're involved in some religious connection that they have and think that that's all it takes. It's, that's all. And, and God says otherwise. Verse 27, Say thus to them, thus says the Lord God, As I live, surely those who are in the ruins shall fall by the sword. And the one who is in the open field I will give to the beasts to be devoured. And those who are in the strongholds and caves shall die of the pestilence. For I will make the land most desolate. Her arrogant strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be so desolate that no one will pass through. Then they shall know that I am the Lord, when I have made the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. And so God basically tells them, not, not only are you not going to possess the land, but this whole land is going to be desolate by the time I'm done. Verse 30, As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you besides the walls and in the doors of the houses, and they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, surely it will come. Then they will know that a prophet has been among them. So this last part of the chapter is about Ezekiel's ministry. And God says it to him because all this time, Ezekiel's been prophesying and nobody's been listening and now it's falling. And, and so God kind of summarizes how this whole thing has all gone for Ezekiel. He says, they listen to you. And he probably realized that. Oh yeah, people are listening. He didn't have it as bad as Jeremiah. Jeremiah got arrested. Jeremiah had it real rough. People were listening to Ezekiel. He had people show up, you know, and, and they've been interested in what you say, God says. And, 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 Partially, that's probably because there wasn't much else to do. I mean, they live in a foreign land now. They probably live among people that don't speak their language, so they had to get together and find something to do. They didn't have Netflix or something like that, so they, you know, no social media to bother with or smartphones, so they, oh, this guy's going to talk? Okay, let's go hear what he says. And they're polite and they're listening and all that kind of stuff, but God tells them they're not really listening to you. It's just interesting. That guy's a good teacher. I like the way he talks. He's really passionate about his message. You know, that kind of stuff. But God says, they don't believe you. And, and then God says, but here's the thing. When all this finally unfolds, then they're going to know. They're going to know, man, that whole time, that guy really was a prophet. He really was talking about the word of God. And there really has been a true prophet among us this whole time. And there's probably a lot of people like that today. People that, you know, know, they, they'll go to church, they'll hear things, and, the, and they'll even be like these people were towards Ezekiel. They're, they're polite. They know how to act and behave in church and that kind of thing. They're like the type of people that James mentioned. You know, they're, they're, they're only hearers of the word. They're not doers of the word. They don't do it. They sit quietly. They're polite, and, and they're, but they don't do it. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. To, to have all the, you know, we have the Word of God. And we live in a time where there is so much access to God's Word. Yeah, I've, I've met so many non-believers that know a decent amount of Bible. 
They know a good amount of Bible. And, and, but they don't do it. And, and God says someday when it all falls apart and it all goes down and every word of the Bible is going to be fulfilled. And they're going to look back and go, man, I should have listened. Just like these people in Ezekiel said, man, there really was, that guy really was a prophet. Why did we listen to him? So we pray because we want them to respond now and not then. Verse 1, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? And so the chapter begins with the message toward the shepherds of Israel. We would call these pastors. They didn't use that term back then. But these are spiritual leaders, the people that we're supposed to care for and feed and guide God's people. And he says, man, you've, your whole thing has been all about you. You haven't been there for those people. You've just been in it to feed yourselves. They were only in it for what they could get for themselves. Maybe money, maybe notoriety, maybe respect, maybe the title. They liked the title. That's all they wanted. And they didn't actually care for the people. If they had, they would have been warning them. If they, had been, if they cared about these people, they wouldn't have been giving false prophecies. They would have been sharing what Ezekiel was sharing. And, um, and it's a terrible shepherd who's in it for themselves, but there's a lot like that today. Verse 3, You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool, and you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, you have not, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So here he tells all the ways that they'd failed to care for God's people as shepherds. One of the things he says there, you eat the fat and close yourselves with the wool. That means instead of caring for sheep, they're slaughtering sheep. I mean, it's a metaphor, but you know, they're in it to get something out of it for themselves. And, and what he says here is not like some sort of that they, it, God's not against them being vocational as shepherds. He's not against them earning a living. The New Testament speaks of that several times, that, you know, uh, that it, it's okay for someone to earn a living uh, being a messenger of God. The problem for these guys was that they did that. They definitely liked having the living off of it, but they neglected their actual responsibility in doing it. All they wanted was to earn a living. They didn't care about the actual care of God's people. And, and he says, here's, here, he, he says all the things that they didn't do. And it's a good list of things that a shepherd is supposed to do. Strengthen the weak, heal the sick, bind up the broken, bring people back, seek the lost and, and to do it lovingly and gently. But, but the bad ones didn't do any of that. They just ruled over the people harshly. They just took their position of authority and lorded it over the people. And, and God took notice of that. And he wasn't happy about that. Verse 5. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the face, the whole face of the earth. And no one was seeking or searching for them. And so God here tells what happens when the shepherds fail, that the people or the flock or the sheep, they scatter, they start to wander, they get into dangerous situations. When a shepherd doesn't feed the sheep, the sheep will still be hungry. So they're going to have to go look for food somewhere else. And that's not the only reason a sheep would go look for food somewhere else. But particularly if the shepherd doesn't feed the sheep, then they're going to have to look for food somewhere else. And, and, and when the shepherd doesn't guide them with the word of God, they're going to look for guidance somewhere else. They, people still need guidance. And if they're not getting it from God's word, then they're going to be like, well, I need to find guidance somewhere else. And they'll get it anywhere. There's plenty of people trying to give people guidance. Here's what's interesting. Now, in the last chapter, Ezekiel was talked to about how he's a watchman. 
His job is to communicate, to tell of danger, to tell people, hey, danger's coming. You need to go over here and get to where it's safe. And his whole job is danger there, safety here. You should leave there and go here. And that's his job. That's part of the guidance of a shepherd. But he was caught, spoken to that as, as a watchman. And, and so the word is to be spoken and with as much fervency and urgency as possible. People are called to live right and walk right and live in the safety of obedience to God and not in the danger of outside obedience to God. And, and they're urged to live that way. And, and some will still go astray. That's why a shepherd's needed. Some will still go astray and the shepherd is to do his best and yet some will still go astray. So there's, there's that issue. It's not that there's never going to be a sheep that wanders even when there's good food being fed. That's already a problem. And that's why the shepherd all the more is supposed to be faithfully feeding and guiding the people because people will wander even when there's good food. You can sit at a table with, with a bunch of your friends at a restaurant and have a really nice plate in front of you. And what do you do? Ooh, what do they got? We as sinners are like always like this. But how much more are you going to be looking at other plates if you don't have your own plate at all? And, and so God's telling these shepherds, this is where you've blown it so badly. These people wander whether you feed them or not. But when you don't feed them, they wander 10 times faster. You got to feed them, he says. And you haven't been. Verse 7. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my flock at their hand and I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep and the shepherds shall feed them themselves no more for I will deliver my flock from their mouths that they may no longer be food for them. And so the, the, the punishment or the, the, the judgment on these shepherds is serious. You're done. You're out. You're no longer, this isn't, you're going to be your role anymore. I mean, and it makes perfect sense. Imagine if you hired somebody to babysit your kids. I mean, their job is to take care of your kids. That's their responsibility. And they don't. I mean, you would never use them ever again. You're done. And how much more is God going to do that with his flock? Verse 11 for thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and in the valleys and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in my judgment. Here's, and this is amazing because in this section, two things are happening. God is saying, here's what I'm going to do since you guys blew it as shepherds. But he's also giving uh, some awesome uh, prophecy relating to the Messiah. The, God says, if, if the shepherds won't do it, I'll do it myself. And he just says, I'm going to, and why wouldn't he? They are his people. Ultimately, the care of God's people is the heart of God more than it is any shepherd. Now, a shepherd should have that heart, but God cares about that more than anyone else. He cares about you more than any pastor ever has. And, and he will care for you even if a pastor fails. This is good news for people that go to a church where maybe the pastor fails morally or quits or bails or just doesn't do anything. God still, God, God didn't bail. The pastor might have, but God didn't. 
But then the other thing that is involved here is he, he talks about how he's going to restore them and bring them. And it's, a, it's an allusion to the regathering of the people into the land. And we'll get into that in the, in the coming chapters even more. And so we have some end times prophecy here, or prophecy that we've been seeing fulfilled. Verse 17, As for you, O my flock, thus says the Lord God, Behold, behold I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture and to have drunk of the clear waters that you must foul the re residue with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat what you have trampled with your feet and they drink what you have fouled with your feet. So he, next he, he uh, makes it clear that the Shepherds aren't the only ones responsible for the condition that the nation or the flock was in. He, here he speaks to the sheep themselves. And he makes it clear that we can't just blame everything on the, the, the ministers. Oh, we, you know, it's not my fault we have a bad pastor. It's not my fault that, pa that minister was bad or that pastor was messed up. It's not, not everything's the pastor's fault. And, and God makes it clear that the shepherds aren't the only ones responsible. The sheep themselves, the flock, the people who are being called out to, the people who are being told, here's where you eat, or hey, that's dangerous, get over here and be safe. Hey, you're in disobedience, go. Those people that are supposed to be hearing that message um, are, are, have, are accountable as well. A bad pastor does not excuse a Christian for sinning. There's bad pastors, but Christians are still responsible for how they live their lives. And so, yes, shepherds are accountable to God, but so is every Christian, too. And he says God judges between people, too. Every case is different. Look at what he said here. He says, I will judge between sheep and sheep. It's not like a one size fits all. I, I know sometimes people are struggling because their pastor wasn't there or he blew it morally and he and sometimes and God knows how much a person can handle so he takes that into account and other times he's like no you knew better yeah your pastor wasn't that great but you knew better or no your pastor was a lot better than you thought you just complained too much and and so God judges these cases individually and so he he, he mentions that it, it's possible for the people of a church to make things bad, it's possible for the pastor to make things bad. Sometimes it's both, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. It's not, it's not always the same. Sometimes a, a really good pastor has a hard time with their people. Other time, a, a, a bunch of good people have a really bad pastor. It just happens. It can go either way. And God knows. He knows that's the case. He rebukes it. He cares about the pastor. He cares about the people. And he, and he wants to bless. Verse 20, Therefore, thus says the Lord, God to them, behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep. Because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns and scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will establish one shepherd over them and he shall feed them. My servant, David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd and I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. So here, God says that he's going to be the one that cares for his flock. He's not going to ultimately let a bad shepherd or bad sheep ruin it for everyone. And here he prophesies of the true shepherd, the good shepherd, Jesus. He calls him my servant David. That's a, that's a, a way of referring to the Messiah because he's uh, Jesus or the Messiah is the son of David. And, and here what he says is what we know because we're New Testament believers, and we know that, yes, there are pastors, but pastors are just under shepherds, really. The true shepherd, the good shepherd is Jesus. And he, he ministers to each one individually because when in the New Testament, we're given the Holy Spirit. And we don't have to, I mean, God still assigns people to shepherd his flock in different capacities. But, but Jesus is our shepherd. And so the, the pastor's job, one of our main jobs as a pastor is we're just, 
trying to tell all the people, man, follow Jesus. Now, hopefully we're saying, follow me as I follow Jesus. But even if the pastor is not doing such a great job, still just follow Jesus. Something happens to me, follow Jesus. Something doesn't happen to me, follow Jesus. Follow him, he's the shepherd. Verse 25, I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land and they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing and I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land and they shall know that I, the Lord, I am the Lord when I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. And they shall no longer be a prey for the nations, nor shall beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely and no one shall make them afraid. I will raise up for them a garden of renown and they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. Thus they shall know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord. And this is really a uh, description of the millennial reign, but it's, it's actually, this, this section we just read is a broad description, which includes their physical regathering into the land, which has been happening for the last 150 years, their reinstatement as a nation, which happened 71 years ago, and what hasn't happened yet, their spiritual return to God. That hasn't happened yet. And, and um, what's, what's so exciting about this kind of section is you got half of it already fulfilled, some of it being fulfilled, and then just a little bit left that hasn't been fulfilled. They've, they've been being gathered in the land for the last 150 years. They became a nation again. That's fulfilled. The only thing left is for them to actually turn and receive Jesus. And he says, God says, that's what I'm going to do. And the cool thing for us is we've already seen half of it done. And if we know half of it's done, then we know the rest of it's going to be done. Verse 31, you are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men and I am your God, says the Lord God. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your commitment and faithfulness to your people. You're faithful, Lord. You're committed to your people. We're, we're, just, we're just sheep, and you're our shepherd, and you are a good shepherd. And so, Lord, help us to follow you faithfully. When we need to repent, may we do it so quickly, so thoroughly. And we can repent a million times if necessary. So if we need it, may we repent. May we stay close to you, our shepherd. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.